This is a message today that goes way beyond ourselves. We're part of a war. This is kind of part two of last week's war sermon. We're part of a war that goes way beyond your kitchen table, goes way beyond the bed that you're sleeping in, way beyond 8242 Pecos Street where we sit right now, goes way beyond what you and I get deceived into thinking is all about our personal lives. And that's what happens to us, right? Our culture has conditioned us to be self-absorbed, and so we have this tendency to think that when we begin to feel pressured and oppressed that it's all about us. It's all about me and my life, but it's not, I'm telling you. This is a blatantly prophetic word today, and I need you to listen carefully. What's going on in the world? Why do so many of you feel the way you do right now? What's the strategic situation for believers like you and me, and how does that affect our daily lives? Those, those are the questions. See, there's a bigger picture we're talking about a wider war, and we all really need to understand this wider war because what comes at you is just one small part of a very well laid out battle plan by our enemy. And what I have to say about all that starts with the promise. I want to start with a promise. It starts with the promise of a great end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I draw that promise from several passages of Scripture, and I just want to run through some. Joel 2.28 through 31. I will come about after this, that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And in the New Testament, in Acts 2, Peter said that the day of Pentecost, that outpouring was the fulfillment of what Joel prophesied. But I see a foreshadowing there of something greater to come. I don't see that everything Joel prophesied happened on the day of Pentecost. And that means there's a foreshadowing. It means it was one fulfillment, there's another to come. There's more to come. There's yet to come. Matthew 24, verses 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, talking about now, the last days, and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. Does this sound like a familiar description yet? But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So you get three things here. One is a time of increasing difficulty for Christians. That's a given. Get used to it. Increasing difficulty for Christians, a time of persecution, and some of it vicious. The second is a great falling away from the faith. People abandoning what they once held to be true. People leaving fellowship. And the third is a great end time in gathering of people to Jesus. The gospel preached in all the nations. And that requires, that requires a fresh, powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because Scripture says you can't confess Jesus is Lord unless by the Holy Spirit. So it's almost a set of contradictions. It's a falling away right next to a great ingathering, but I see all these things unfolding today in the world. See, while a, while a great falling away is going on in the Western developed world, in much of the rest of the world, people are coming to Jesus at a record pace. There's, it's, it's, it's unprecedented. And it's accompanied by, it's sparked by signs and wonders and healings and resurrections from the dead that come from a powerful outpouring of God's Spirit and the number of unreached people groups who have never heard the gospel preached to them ever before is shrinking dramatically year by year. It's probably 80 or 90 percent smaller than it was when I was in seminary in the 70s. Unreached people groups. 
And then there are the persecutions that are increasing in every part of the world at a level never seen before. I want you to understand thoroughly and completely there is a war going on and you're involved whether you know it or not, whether you want to be or not, and whether you're aware of it or not. God is about to ramp up the outpouring of the Spirit to win as many people as possible to Jesus before his return. And the enemy of our soul knows that and is desperate, desperate to buy himself some time because he knows his time is limited. He wants to cut it off before it can take shape and gather strength. Another passage, Revelation 6, starting at verse 1. Then I saw the Lamb... I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a, loud, or as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, these are the seals on the scroll that contains um, the revelation of the end times. He broke the second seal. I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not damage the oil and the wine. That, that, that speaks of scarcity of food products. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. (coughs) When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now, I read all of that to say this. A lot of commentators believe that the first horse, the white horse, they believe that that's a false gospel going into the earth in the end times. I don't believe the symbolism sustains that. I believe that the symbolism unmistakably points to Jesus. It points to the gospel. A white horse and a crown points to the gospel going forth victoriously in the earth in the midst of accelerating trouble and in the midst of vicious persecution against Christians. The truth and the person of Jesus cannot be stopped. That's a promise. But the persecution comes. And the opposition comes. It comes from an enemy desperate to stop it because he knows he doesn't have much time left. The goal of that opposition, this war, that you and I are engaged in right now, in all the forms in which it comes, and I'm going to talk about some of those forms today, is to silence the voice of Christians in this world. It's to shut you up and shut you down. So I want to connect some dots today in terms of what's going on in the world. I want to put together a picture of what's going on and how it affects you. Back in early 2011, I was writing Visions of the Coming Days to be released in 2012. I want to read to you just a a brief excerpt. I wrote this. Especially in light of the current historic recession, war remains a significant danger with numerous flashpoints around the world. Pray for strength and wisdom for our leaders and for the Lord to disarm the spirit of war. Historically, the enemy has often incited war to stop a worldwide revival. And I went on in the book to describe a particular period in history when revival had broken out and missions were going into the world, and they really believed. Matter of fact, I'll tell you when it was. It was the two, in 2006, 2004 to 2006. 2004, the Welsh revival, 2000, 19, I'm sorry, 
You get old, you get confused about time. 1904 to 196. Oi. 1904 to 196. 1904, the Welsh revival broke out and sparked a major movement of worldwide missions. In 1906, the Azusa Street revival broke out and, and fed into that and launched the great Pentecostal revival that's led more people to the Lord than any other movement I can think of in history. They believed that they could complete the Great Commission within their lifetime. And the enemy moved to stop it. And World War I broke out and stop, stopped it, basically. So after describing that, I went on and I said this in the book. Once more we stand on the cusp. Unprecedented worldwide revival is underway. Large numbers of people are coming to Jesus on every continent. The enemy would love to start a war to shut it all down before the current younger generation in the Western world can experience a revival in their own time, something they have yet to see in fullness. We were part of Partners in Harvest, and I called Dan Slade, who is still the international coordinator for Partners in Harvest. And I asked if I could just, I just said, can I just bring a ministry team? And just pray at, at, at one, of the, you know, one of your big meetings that you do over there. I didn't want to be a speaker. I just wanted to come with a team and we just pray for people. Well, he got back to me and he said, well, why don't you come be a speaker for our Catch the Fire conference for all of Ukraine? And then it turned out that John couldn't be there and so I became the featured speaker. When I got there, the Lord gave me a prophetic word for Ukraine. And this is what I've been building up to. The word was that Ukraine would be a stealth torpedo in the Lord's arsenal. The word was that no one would expect anything great to come out of Ukraine. Kind of like in Bible times, you know, can anything good come out of Galilee? Well, nobody would expect anything good to come out of Ukraine. Ukraine's never been a world leader. But the Lord said to me, Ukraine has no blood on its hands. Ukraine never started a war. The Nazis raged across Ukraine on their way to defeat Russia. Russia raged across Ukraine on their way back. They have no blood on their hands. And the Lord said to me that, that he was going to raise up major revival leaders out of Ukraine who would affect the world. And no one would expect to see them coming. The enemy wouldn't see them coming. They, they were a stealth torpedo. This is what I prophesied to them. Well, here's, and I called for people to pray. I've now been to Ukraine seven times with teams, and I have watched some of the finest leaders I know grow. I mean, I've seen men rise up in strength and integrity and in wisdom. I've seen signs and wonders happen. You wouldn't believe what's going on in Krasnoyarsk. We have we've invested more there than in any other church in Ukraine. They became, I just want to paint this picture before I tell you what's going on right now. They became a major revival center for the whole Russian-speaking world. Little town of 50,000 people. People were coming after we'd ministered there. I'd like to think we were part of this. <laughs> the people were coming from all over the Russian-speaking world for healing meetings. Hundreds, hundreds of incredible healings going on. Well, when the war started there in Ukraine a few months ago, I knew it was the enemy I knew it's, it's, it's not about politics. It's about the enemy trying to stop what I had seen coming for Ukraine and that I've seen growing and that I called people to pray for. And, when I, when, and, and I actually, I went on, on Facebook and I, and I said, please pray for Ukraine. This is the enemy trying to stop what the Lord wants to bring out of Ukraine for the sake of the world. Well, here's the situation now. I want to read you some excerpts from a letter from Dima Oleshko. He's the pastor of the church in Krasnoyarsk, that church I've mentioned we've ministered in more than any other. Here it is. Reads a little strange because English is not his native language. Unfortunately, the high voltage power lines got damaged due to shelling in our area. Almost all the major mines in the region have stopped working. The workers have been sent home for unpaid vacations. Mines are the main source of income and the city's replenishment in our area. For three weeks, there is no water in the cities, but we do not despair. 
due to lack, and he talks about going out to shop, you know, just to try and, they're looking for water to wash with anywhere they can get it. They're trying to buy water in the stores. Due to the lack of electricity in the western part of our area, there is no water supply. Everyone looks for water to bathe, to wash dishes, and do the laundry wherever he is succeed to find. Today there is no electricity in 54 localities of the Donetsk region. Terrorists are constantly shooting and do not give repairers to repair the line. In eastern Ukraine, hundreds of thousands of people were displaced. Corridors for safe inhabitants' exit are made, but the terrorists do not allow people to leave the cities. They are shooting at cars and buses. People have become hostages in the cities. All men who are seen by terrorists on the streets of cities get caught and sent to the ranks of terrorist forces. Men are forced to fight for the terrorists and do all the hard work. Terrorists take away the cars and grab the men as hostage. Even in our calm and quiet town, a few people were abducted in front of the other people in the afternoon. Every news report tells about casualties among civilians. Brother from our church died at the roadblock. A suicide bomber on a bus which was packed with explosives drove into a roadblock. Our brother was close. Five people who were standing there got torn to pieces. His remains have not been buried yet because all those pieces mixed up and you need a lot of time to DNA to determine whose are those pieces of the body. Now we're trying to support and help his wife, our sister in Christ. All the refugees from Donetsk and Lugansk are running through our town. Church is helping refugees actively. People are placed in houses of believers at the church's buildings and all we try to help them with everything they need. I'm going to read some more of it in a minute, but I've made an appeal on Facebook for support. They don't have, they don't have enough money. They're trying to feed their own people. And they're trying to feed these refugees, and there's no income coming in. And so I made an appeal for funds, and I don't know how much has come into our Facebook account, but there were two people who forgot to designate it and emailed me, and that amounted to almost $1,100. If you would like to donate toward this, then you, know, you can put some money in an envelope designated to Ukraine, write a check to New Song designated to Ukraine. We're going to Western Union it next week. Okay? In a pre previous email, he told me about the separatists forcibly closing churches. I spoke with Dan Slade last week. He told me of two churches in the Partners in Harvest network that were dissolved because the pastors had to flee for their lives to the western part of Ukraine. It's bad. Here's some more of his letter. I received a prophetic word about Ukraine and posted it to the internet. Ukraine is before the Lord's eyes. Angels of the Lord by the prayers of the saints are coming in large numbers into the territory of Ukraine. The war in Ukraine will end in the different way than many people think. There will be an event that will turn the course of history and put the end to the war. The end of the war will be very fast and unexpected for everyone. It will happen very soon. Ukrainian people will build a new country. A lot of refugees will return to Ukraine quickly. People from many countries will be moving to Ukraine for permanent residence. This country will not be like other countries. Ukraine is unique in its kind, and other countries will look to Ukraine and bring, up, bring it up as an example. Despite all the destruction, Ukraine is rising rapidly. Restoration in Ukraine will be so fast that there will be done much more for one year than it was done for ten years. Ukraine will become a strong exporter, not only of food and goods, but also of technologies for the world. Technologies which are not in the world yet will appear in the Ukraine. God gives mercy and grace to Ukraine. Sounds a whole lot like the word I gave, only I focused on revival. Dima stopped just short of asking for funds. But he didn't have to. I want to raise money. I want to help him. And I read all that to say that this one touches us closely. And the war there is the desperate attempt of the enemy of our soul to silence the Christian voice there that's destined to affect the world outside of Ukraine, flowing from Ukraine. Now, in the Arab and Muslim worlds, Christians are being slaughtered in record numbers, if you haven't been in touch with this, by the thousands. Whole regions are being emptied of believers. They're either killed or they're fleeing. I'm talking about Iraq, where Christians 
are being driven by ISIS from their villages in order to survive, flee and into the mountains where they have nothing to eat, nothing to drink, because if they stay, they're dead. Afghanistan. Christians are being killed there. Taliban is recovering lost ground. And as our troops leave, it's going to get worse. Pakistani Christians live in danger every day. I don't know if you've followed the news over the last couple of years, but whole Christian neighborhoods have been burned because somebody said they blasphemed the prophet Muhammad. You all know about that pregnant woman, you should, sentenced to death in Sudan for, for, for apostatizing from, from Islam because she, married, she was a Christian she married a Christian man. And if you think Islam is a religion of peace, think again. In the Western world, in Europe, in America, you and I are being labeled bigots, dangerous, hate-filled enemies of tolerance, and laws are being passed that would force us to violate our biblical conscience. Anti-Semitism, especially in Europe, is rising, and it's rising in lockstep with opposition to Christianity. Now here's something I want to suggest to you. I believe that anti-Semitism and opposition to Christianity are related and connected. It's the same spirit. Amen. Take a look at how the world is turned against Israel when all Israel is doing is defending itself. And all of a sudden now the whole world is turned against Israel. And I'm hearing more and more reports of anti-Semitism, especially arising in Europe. The enemy intends this opposition, this rising anti-Semitism and non-support for Israel. He intends it to be blamed on Christians. And I'll tell you how that works. My roommate in college was Jewish. I had my first Seder in his family's home at their table. And he said something to me once. I was trying to tell him, all these people around you, they're not all Christians. He said, well, if they're not Christian, what are they? Because in the minds of most Jewish people, if you're not Jewish and you live in America, you're Christian. You follow me? And so where anti-Semitism rises, it's likely to be blamed on us. Whether we're anti-Semitic or not. And the reason for that is that the enemy wants to prevent the great end time grafting in of the Jewish people that Paul prophesied in Romans 11. It's all about silencing our voice. Are you catching me? All these pieces world, around the world, it's the enemy's well-laid plan to silence our voice. In nearly every nation of the world, for you and me, in a country where we're not murdered and our homes aren't burned, it gets real personal. But the goal is the same. It's to silence your voice. But it's a different kind of attack on you. If it were blatant and if it were open, you'd stand up in defiance and you'd refuse to be silent. But it's more subtle than that. It's the same war, but it's more subtle than that. It's the kind of attack that took the heart of Timothy. That was the young man that Paul left in charge of the church in Ephesus. And you can read it in First and Second Timothy. I'll just summarize some of it. People discounted Timothy because of how young he was. Didn't want to listen to him. They disrespected his teaching. And I know how that feels. Because it's been done to me. False teachers had come in to dispute what he taught. There were people just ignoring his authority. Partly because he was young. He had chronic health problems that were sapping his strength and his energy. And all that combined pressure on him was relentless enough that as I read between the lines, he'd become so discouraged that he'd laid down his gifts and was in danger of quitting. It had taken his heart. Well, the Apostle Paul never spoke into a vacuum, and here's some of what he wrote to Timothy. He wrote it because there was a problem. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. And some of you need to hear these things. 
This command I entrust to you, Timothy. See, I'm not asking you, Timothy. This is a command. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. Anybody here get discouraged about prophecies made concerning you? In accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith in a good conscience. Later on, 1 Timothy 4, 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Same chapter, verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life with which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The apostle doesn't speak into a vacuum. 2 Timothy 1, 6-8. For this reason, I remind you, kindle afresh the gift of God. Why? He'd let it die. You don't tell somebody to kindle, to kindle something afresh if it hasn't lapsed. There are gifts in this room right now. The enemy's tried to silence your voice. Stand up. Get mad. Pick up your sword and kindle afresh the gift that God has bestowed upon you. Through the laying on of my hands, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. You don't have to, it doesn't take a lot of reading between the lines to know that in these two letters, Paul is speaking to a young man who had become timid in his ministry. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. The enemy had been trying to silence this young man's voice. He said, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. See, the enemy wants to silence your voice by taking your heart. With the exception of certain pockets of revival around the country, I see this kind of thing hitting masses of believers all over the country right now. It's a loss of hope. It's a sense of malaise and the feeling that God isn't doing anything. The sense that God's way off someplace. Where are you, Lord? See, the enemy's trying to silence the voice of God's people by sucking the hope and the life out of them. It gets personal. And so the life crises and the hurts and the disappointments pile up. But it's the same war. It's the same war. It's the same strategy. It's just that we don't get beheaded. You don't see what you want to see happening in your faith. You don't see what you want to see happening in your ministry. Maybe maybe it's health problems piling up. You know, your own and your friends. And they wear you down. I'm getting real tired of, you know... I love you, I'll come see you in the hospital, but I'm getting real tired of it. (laughs) I don't want to do that anymore. We need an outpouring of the Spirit. We need to rise up, cry out, and not let our voice be silenced in the world or before the throne of God. It's time for our voice to be heard in prayer. We need to make our voice heard before the throne and before the world. And the enemies tried to silence it. Problems at work suck the life out of you because of stress. And then just like me, you begin to tell yourself, I'm too tired. Your kids get hit with setbacks and tragedies and you ache over that. I was with the youth group last Thursday night because Nathan had a wedding rehearsal and I, you know, I felt their hopelessness. As a, you know, when we were kids, we were full of hope. We were going to change the world. We were going to make everything different. You know, we were smoking our dope and doing our LSD and thought we had the world by the tail. Duh. <laughs> but I felt that hopelessness in, in, in the kids. One of the kids put it, he, he, he said it, he didn't realize how eloquent he was being. One of the kids said, he said, the problems are just too big. It's too big for us to make a difference. They feel overwhelmed. And so there's a pressure on them to give up before the game even begins. It's the same war. 
Same strategy, just a different approach. And so the hope gets sucked out, and you begin to say, what are you doing, God? Where are you? And you get tired, and you get discouraged, and you get sick in your spirit. And at that point, if you let it, your voice falls silent, and your ministry languishes. And at that point, if you give up, it's match point, score one, devil. But it's the nature of the warfare to shut you up and hide you away. See, by immobilizing you, the enemy can stop the end time. He can, he can prevent you from moving in the end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit to bring in a harvest of the lost, even in the midst of darkness and trouble. See, the enemy of our soul wants to buy himself some time. So whether it's people being slaughtered in a war like the one in Ukraine or this oppression that gets really personal here at home, it's the same war, the same goal, shut the Christians up, stop them, nullify their impact. Let me clarify a little bit the strategy the enemies carried out. First, it was what Paul described in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. He, said, he, he, he spoke there of the schemes of the devil well-laid plans, well-laid strategies. And he went on to say, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so our enemy has put together a plan. He's working to carry it out. And with you and me, it's first through demonic influence that's what we call a spiritual principality. It's what it does. It's a ruling demonic presence. Its first goal is to influence the thoughts and values of a culture. It's to shape a culture, to make us all think in a particular way, consonant with what the demon thinks. That's what we're under right now. We're under an enormous pressure right now. The ruling spirit over our culture is ancient Baal. And he seeks to make this culture begin to think and feel and act according to the values of that culture according to the mindset of the culture he wants to, to craft, until we no longer reflect Judeo-Christian values and morals, but we reflect the values and the morals of the demonic. And you've got to be blind not to see it. The enemy of our soul has accomplished that goal in the culture in which you and I live. It's the same values and morals that influenced and shaped the nations around Israel in ancient Bible times. And so we have come as a culture to accept all forms of sexual immorality and perversion. We've become steeped in a self-focus that runs so deep we're not even aware of it. Our relationships suffer. Our children are lost and without purpose. Integrity is eroded and in the name of self we don't deal honestly in government or business anymore. If there's anybody here that still trusts our government, I need to pray for you. you got a problem. You need to take a pill. I'm serious. In this culture that the enemy has now bought, created among us, no one's really guilty. We're all good people, aren't we? We're all just victims of circumstance or, or victims of the bad actions of others, but we're all good people. And so... We're not sinners, you know. Personal responsibility for life fails as a value. Lawlessness and lovelessness take root. Society begins to crumble. And then God, in this culture, becomes a wimpy, powerless, warm fuzzy in the sky who just loves everybody without demanding anything of them or holding anybody accountable for anything. Does that sound familiar? The enemy intended that once he'd established that culture, then those of us who've stood our ground, those of us who've not joined that cultural mindset, we would then become the objects of hatred. Because now we're seen as dangerous threats. In the case of Islam, on the other end of things, it's the demonic religious spirit that's captivated cultures, as opposed to our own immorality, I mean, they've gone extreme the other way, but the outcome is the same with regard to Christians. Regard them as dangerous. Real Christians have to be silenced because they're now dangerous. 
And so you and I begin to feel oppression. But it gets real personal. If it were often a direct affront on your faith, you wouldn't fall for it. But it's the kind of thing that hits us in our daily life. It's the kind of thing that hits us in our hope. It's the kind of thing that tells us that, that, that it, everything's futile. And so we begin to experience that pressure. The inst- enemy couldn't instigate a campaign, a literal murder against us in the Western world like in the Muslim world, so he instigated a campaign of spiritual and emotional murder. Take your hope, take your faith, take your joy, silence your voice. I have watched The Lord of the Rings more times than I want to confess. And at the end, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, the episode is called The Return of the King. Aragorn, who is king of Gondor, has gathered his army at the gates of Mordor. There aren't very many of them, and this overwhelming army of orcs and trolls pours out of the gates of all kinds of evil things. They pour out of the gates of Mordor, and they completely, you know, they're, they're about to completely surround the army of Gondor. And you can you look at the eyes of the soldiers, and you can see the fear and the uncertainty in their eyes. And at that point, Aragorn, on his horse, rides back and forth before the army, and he gives this speech. My brothers, I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but it is not this day. An hour of woe and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down, but it is not this day. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand. I got two timid applauses. <laughs> Paul said it in Ephesians 6.13. He said, resist. He, same thing. Aragorn said, I bid you stand. Paul said, resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm therefore, he said. Well, Aragorn won that fight. And so will we. Amen. 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 Jesus, you are amazing. We are committed to you. We are your people. Lord, forgive us for being wimpy. Forgive us for rolling over before our enemy. Lord, we choose this day to stand. We choose to honor you. This day, we fight. This day. And the size of our enemy has nothing to do with it. Because it was that sacrifice that was made on top of Calvary that has determined the outcome of the battle. Your resurrection power in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.